The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. When we avoid awkward topics, it can leave a wide open space for misinformation or even disinformation. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Tonight, as we begin our week recalling some of the best myth-busting conversations we've had on the agenda, we return to our 2019 interview with Dr. Jen Gunter about her indispensable book, The Vagina Bible. Dr. Jen Gunter is a Canadian gynecologist who lives and works in Northern California and has been called Twitter's resident gynecologist. Her 2017 blog post criticizing a product made famous or rather infamous, just Google it, by actor Gwyneth Paltrow went viral. Then she wrote The Vagina Bible, which became a national bestseller and is considered an essential antidote to misinformation about women's health. Dr. Gunter's second book challenges another hush-hush topic, the menopause manifesto. Dr. Gunter is honest, unapologetic, and fierce in her delivery. We now look back on our first conversation from 2019. So I am a woman of a certain age. I have two kids, but every time I say vagina, I feel like I need to whisper it. Right. That's not uncommon. Uh -huh. So, you know, obviously as a gynecologist, I say vagina all the time mm -hmm. and I say it all day and my kids have grown up, my boys have grown up, you know, <laughs> seeing things all over the house, vagina and vulva. But even women in private conversations with other women mm -hmm. have trouble saying the word vagina and vulva. And, you know, that's one of the reasons I wanted the word on the cover of the book. I wanted to normalize that it's a body part. Because if you can't say a word, that implies that there's shame with it. Euphemisms are there because of shame. And there is nothing shameful about your normal, glorious vagina and vulva. And something that half the population has. Exactly. Half the population has. So if you want to, you know, make half the population feel bad about themselves, mm -hmm. making them speak in euphemisms about their own body parts is a good way to start. Well, in the first chapter, you say that you have a vagenda. Yes. Uh, what do you mean by that? Well, my vagenda is for every woman, really every person, to have accurate information about their bodies so they can be an empowered patient and they can be an empowered person. Because when you don't know how your body works, how your body works to have sex, what might to expect, you expect at the doctor's office or what to expect with having children, it puts you at a disadvantage. And, you know, we still have glass ceilings for a reason because women have been disadvantaged. And one of the core tenets of the patriarchy is lying about women's bodies. And so I feel that it is an ultimate act of feminism to speak accurately about women's bodies. And that's my vagenda. I mean, I didn't realize that um, the vagina and the vulva are two completely different things? Well, they're part of one thing? Right, so I hear this all the time. So the vagina has kind of become the, the catch-all phrase to describe both the inside and the outside. But in medicine, the vagina is the tract that connects the cervix with the outside world, the uterus with the vulva. The vulva is the part where your clothes touch your skin. And so I would see women coming into the office and they say, oh, my vagina itches and they've, no one had been able to solve that problem. And the first thing I would do is I'd say, well, I want you to point out on this diagram where you mean. And it's like, okay, that's your vulva. So the first thing we do is to educate. I hear this from women from all backgrounds. So it's very common. But you know, if you, again, don't talk about the vulva, then you're also excluding conversations about the clitoris and the labia and all these things that can also bring sexual pleasure. Well, why are women so misinformed when it comes to such an important part of our anatomy? You mentioned the patriarchy. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a huge part. And I, I know that sometimes people say, oh, it can't all be the patriarchy. But, you know, well, it actually when can you say, be. When you say the patriarchy, what do you mean? I mean this systematic, um, a, a society where um, men hold the power and women are largely excluded from it, right? And so, you know, we, 
we ha don't have half of our officials being, you know, women. If you look at po politicians, if you look at the Supreme Court, if you look at all these places of higher power where legal decisions are being made about how we live our lives, it's not 50 percent mm -hmm. women and men. It's it's unequal. But I think that also then translates. So not only do we have this sort of systematic oppression, but medicine has been hopelessly patriarchal, right? So we've had largely male physicians. Women's bodies have been understudied. We have um, not taken women's concerns seriously, right? So women come in, they have their pain dismissed. We know, for example, when women have chest pain, they're more likely to be sent home from the emergency department. And if a man has chest pain, he's more likely to be worked up for a heart attack, right? So we have all those things. And then on top of it, we have purity myths. We have the idea that uh, having sex before marriage is wrong for women, that a woman's worth has been distilled to her hymen. So very specifically, the way women's bodies work has been weaponized against them. Um, when it comes to you know us uh, finding information, and, and you mentioned Dr. Google, <laughs> who I relied a lot on when I had children, um, there's a lot of stuff online that you know we should be. I don't know. I don't want to. I don't want to make fun of anybody because I've also fallen. You know, I've believed certain things that mm -hmm. I shouldn't believe. Um, why do you think we're so apt to believe in misinformation? Yeah, I mean, I think absolutely. I never blame the person going there in good faith looking for information. I blame the predators taking advantage of them. I think that it's, I mean, misinformation is fantastical, right? It's, oh, I can cure everything. I can solve everything. Take this pill and you'll lose 20 pounds. I mean, hey, I'd love to take a pill and lose 20 pounds, right, with no side effects. But the reality is that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So I think that medicine is in many ways stodgy and boring. You know, it takes years and years and years to study things to get good answers. And even then, we have to keep studying it to know for sure. Mm -hmm. And that's really hard even for scientists to understand sometimes, never mind people who you know, don't have advanced degrees in science. And then I think also, too, the way the information is presented online is that it's more accessible. It seems the sites that offer misinformation speak to people in a way. They offer these science-ish terms, and they present the illusion that they care about you more. Than, than, than sort of the dry medical information. People don't want dry information. They want practical stuff that speaks to them. And snake oil and wellness has kind of figured out a way to do that. More on wellness in just a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but one of the things that struck me when I was reading the, your book was the type of products that used to be marketed to women. I'm sure even now there are a lot of problematic ones that you go through. Right. Um, but let's take a look at this, um, that image right there. Um, it's shocking to me. Um, why would women be told that they needed Lysol for their vaginas? Because Lysol is now used for house cleaning products. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you, Lysol is a disinfectant. I think there's a couple of reasons. So there was an idea, and there has long been an idea, that the vagina is dirty, which it's not, um, and needs to be cleaned, which it doesn't. But also some of these ads were also euphemisms for um, sort of home abortion and contraception. So people used to think that if you, you know, douched with something, you might kill the sperm and then you wouldn't get pregnant, or that this might be, so, and of course it was a woman's responsibility to not have all the children, right? You couldn't possibly put that, that burden on the person with the sperm. Uh, so, so some of these ads are truly like preying on the idea that your vagina is dirty and needs to be cleaned and prepped for men, which we still see in modern day with douches and wipes and feminine sprays and how to make your vagina smell better, which it's fine how it is. Mm -hmm. um, and then also um, possibly some of these are also remnants from the time when contraception was illegal and abortion was illegal and you could only speak to women in euphemisms. Mm -hmm. So if you're only speaking in euphemisms, I mean, first of all, these products can't prevent you from getting pregnant, but secondly, then how do you know what they mean? And then they can be weaponized in other ways. So euphemisms are very dangerous. Very dangerous. Um, what would it take? You mentioned, you know, that uh, the, this idea that the vagina is dirty, um, and on your web series, Jen Splaining, you say that it's a self-cleaning oven. <laughs> um, what would it take to shift the cultural perception um, that vaginas and vulvas uh, somehow dirty? Well, I think it takes first of all every child growing up saying those words, right? Because if you can't say the word then there's an implication of sturdy right there. And I think that these messages about um, these companies that sell these products, you know, we have finally been able to get the message out to people that cigarettes are bad for you, right? Even though people do continue to smoke, there's also the addiction part of cigarettes. You know, these products, douches, wipes, 
hygiene sprays, they're as damaging really for your body as cigarettes are. So I think that- Are we, they? Because yes. I mean, they're sold in stores and yeah. there's no warning signs or well, anything. Well, in the States, I don't know if it's the same in Canada, mm -hmm. douches have warning labels like cigarettes. Yeah, douches are associated with pelvic inflammatory disease. If you use them, you are more likely to catch HIV if you're exposed, catch gonorrhea if you're exposed. So, but if you can't talk about sex and sexually transmitted diseases without stigma or without shame, how do you get those messages apart? Uh, get those messages to people. So high quality sex education early in schools is also essential because Informing kids about their bodies doesn't make them go and have more sex. Mm -hmm. In the same way that informing kids about seatbelts doesn't teach them to drive, you know, it, like they're in the Fast and the Furious. You became well known for calling out um, BS on websites like Goop, which is uh, Gwyneth Paltrow's uh, second incarnation after being an actress. <laughs> uh, why did you feel the need to challenge her? Well, I had been calling out uh, like celebrities with anti-vaccine information before that, and also calling out politicians for bad information as well. Mm -hmm. So really anybody in the public eye spreading misinformation. And, and one day somebody sent me uh, this <laughs> post about vaginal steaming, which you shouldn't do, because um, there's so many layers of wrong with it. And I just thought, oh my God, this is so ridiculous. And obviously I'm a <laughs> vaginal and vulvar expert, so you know I quickly wrote off a post about that, and it went viral and crazy. And I mean, I had like People Magazine, like all these things, you know, I, like it's just like, I'm a gynecologist, why do you want to talk to me, right? And, um, and that's when I kind of realized like how this sort of sweet spot of being a celebrity and also being the only person talking kind of publicly about the vagina, but talking about it in a weaponized way. Mm -hmm. Because vaginal steaming is a direct sort of descendant of the vagina being dirty and toxic. It's not feminist, it's anti-feminist, it's misogyny. So you know, pointing that out, people were desperate, I think, to have physicians say why that stuff is wrong. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so, and then we started getting into, I started, you know, writing different things about the things I'd read on Goop, not all the time. I mean, I spent a lot of time on there. People would send me, people send me crazy stuff from all different kinds of websites. I mean, that's how I learned about vaginal kung fu. It's not really a thing, but just saying, that's weightlifting with your vagina. You, do, you don't need to do that. <laughs> I know. So then, and then Any I- Any trepidation in calling out somebody like her online? Because, no. no. I don't, I mean, I see myself as, somebody has to hold the line in the sand about women's bodies. Mm -hmm. And who better than a gynecologist, right? Mm -hmm. like, like, you don't get to lie about women's bodies on my watch. That's the way it is. And yeah, there's a lot of it, sometimes there's a tension about it, but I mean, I think I, I know that I'm right medically because I can back it up. And it's amazing to me how much women and men have responded to wanting to have the person who has the educational background to speak up about women's bodies. People are actually tired of hearing from celebrities, I think. Um, what can be done to protect the consumer public from you know, this kind of uh, product peddling? Yeah, I think that governments have to really step up. This idea that selling supplements or selling douches or all these scammy products are allowed and they're completely unstudied on tests. Like for example, douches, they should be illegal. I mean, cigarettes should be illegal too, but they should be, if you can't make them illegal, and I don't understand why you couldn't, then they should be taxed like cigarettes. They should have that same taxation on them. I mean, we live in a country in Canada where we say if you're going to use certain products, they get taxed because they burden the healthcare system. Douches burden the healthcare system. Tax them for what they are. Don't allow people to sell unregulated supplements. I mean, some studies from the states have shown supplements up to 70% can contain adulterated products like stimulants or antidepressants. People don't know what they're putting in their body. And, you know, liver failure, supplements are a common contributor to that. Well, when it comes to supplements or even, we, I think we have this idea that because it's natural, it's, uh, it's good for you, <laughs> um, and we think that it's better than taking a drug. I know, but it's so funny, if you take that one more step, the most natural thing is to have the food on your plate. And that's what your body's designed to do. Your body's not designed to absorb mega doses of vitamins. It's designed to absorb, or has evolved to absorb, mm -hmm. the small amount that the small amount of vitamin C that's in, um, you know, an orange, mm -hmm. or the small amount that's, you know, the the iron that's in, you know, a leafy vegetable or broccoli or in meat. Like that, we've absorbed, we've evolved to abs to absorb it in that way. But how, as a consumer, how do you um, avoid that? Because uh, the wellness industry, it, it seems like it's in everything. It's all around us. So right. how, as a consumer, can you avoid that and make the better choice? Well, I think 
the, the, the number one piece of information, if people only learn one thing from me, besides you can say the word vagina and vulva, and they're two different things. The second thing, if people learn from me, would be you can never take health advice from someone selling you the product, right? So if someone's selling you supplements, you can't take advice from them about that. If someone's selling you a douche, you can't take advice from them about that. I mean, imagine if you say, well, I want to learn more about depression. Would you go to a psychiatry association? Would you go to Health Canada? Or would you go to the drug company that sells antidepressants, mm. right? So if you, every single thing people think about wellness, what I'd like them to do is substitute a pharmaceutical company. And would they approach it the same way? Because you actually say that uh, Big Natural, what you call the wellness industry, is not, uh, doesn't get the same kind of scrutiny as Big Pharma. Right, they should. I mean, they're a $4 trillion a year industry. They don't have to prove any of their products work. And they get to say whatever they want. I mean, I'm no fan of Big Pharma, but at least they do some testing, right? At least there's some studies. And in the States, the FDA does post-marketing surveillance. So they have issues. Um, but my, you know, my, my favorite quote is from the physician, Ben Goldacre, and I wish I had come up with this. Uh, he's a, a British physician, and it's about, about you know, medicine, and he does a lot of work with, the, with um, lack of transparency in the pharmaceutical industry. And he says, if there's a problem with the airline industry, the answer isn't to invest in magic carpets. That's shade if I've ever heard one. <laughs> <laughs> but, right? right? You know, there are gaps in medicine. I absolutely, absolutely um, understand that and believe it. But wellness is exploiting those gaps. It's not filling those gaps. And if wellness really cared, they wouldn't make wild claims. They would study their products so they could become medicine. Let's talk about vulvas for a few more minutes yes. before we wrap up. Um, what should every person know about the vulva? They should know the vulva's glorious. In what ways? Um, well, so it is uh, the, uh, it protects the vaginal opening. It's part of your protective mechanism against dirt and bacteria. It is very sexually responsive. You know, we glorify penises. We should be glorifying vulvas in the same way. You know, your clitoris is part of your vulva. Your labia minora, the inner lips, are very sensitive. They have specialized nerve endings. They engorge with blood during sexual activity. Um, so I would like people to know that, that um, that's a glorious, amazing organ that should be worshipped. What would you say to a patient if they approached you and were asked asking about maybe getting their vulva uh, cosmetically altered. Yeah, so there, there is a, a growing trend, especially among young women for that. And there's this idea that it is uncool or abnormal to have your labia minora be longer than your labia majora. However, half of women are built that way, half. So that's like, an, it's not even a variant. Like there's two forms of women and they're exactly, you know, the same numbers. Half have labia minora that are smaller and half have labia minora that are larger. I think in your book you mentioned it's because it, they don't look, they look a certain way in like um, yoga pants or something. Yeah, so there are cosmetic surgeons that advertise that women should, that, that labial reductions to reduce the size of the labia minora could help you look smoother in yoga pants. Would we ever say to a man that you should get the size of your penis reduced so you have less of a bulge in your jeans? I've never heard that. Right. Exactly. They're both the same sexually responsive organs. So we, the idea that we should change women to fit their clothes, why don't we change clothes to fit the women? And, you know, when, when people talk about um, how the labia might look in tight clothes, we um, often pejoratively sort of use the term camel toe, which I hate. And so I think we should rebrand that as labial cleavage. Cleavage is good. Yes. <laughs> Well, women spend a lot of time and money uh, getting rid of uh, pubic hair. Um, what, yay or nay? Well, it's a personal preference. It's a cosmetic modification, right? I dye my hair. I know it's a shocker. I make a choice to do that. I understand that I could get contact dermatitis or a reaction to the dye. Mm -hmm. What I want people to know is that pubic hair is normal. We have it to protect the vulva. We have it to keep the moisture in because the skin can dry out there. And it probably traps dirt and debris. So if you want to remove your pubic hair, it would be the same as, you know, do you want to remove part of your eyebrows? Do you want to wax your eyebrows? Do you want to get your ears pierced? Do you want to get your tongue pierced? So think of it as a body modification. And understand, like all body modifications, there are risks. If you remove your pubic hair, there are some studies that tell us you might be at higher risk for getting a viral STD, like herpes or HIV, if you're exposed. Uh, there's also uh, 
injuries from waxes and shaving. And so those are things to, you know, I trust women to make decisions with their bodies. Here are the facts. If you know the facts and you wanna do, great. With the information comes power, right? Exactly. Um, let's move on to the vagina. Okay. Is there a G-spot? So the G-spot is this, the way it's been um, misspoken about in common society would be that there's this sort of magic spot that you can touch and stimulate and it's gonna do it for every woman. The original paper by Dr. Grafenberg actually reflects what we know today, is that the clitoris is this huge structure underneath the skin, and part of it is very intimate with the urethra, the tube that drains the bladder. And you can um, stimulate some of that tissue by touching on what we call the anterior wall of the vagina, so kind of right under the bladder. But every woman is shaped differently. Mm -hmm. So some women have, may have more erectile tissue there, some may have more in other spots. So if touching in that spot is good for you, great. But if not, it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. Just like some people like one kind of food and some people like the other. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, a lot of sex therapists like to, instead of call it the G spot, like to call it the Come here, spot. Come here, spot. Um, you mentioned the hymen earlier, and one of the most interesting things in this book that I found is the explanation of why we have a hymen in the first place. Um, most people are led to believe that it's to show that, you know, you have never had sex before, you're a virgin, right? Uh, but that's not it, right? Well, there's no proof of that, and that's a hopelessly patriarchal construct. And as I explain in the book, it doesn't make any sense. Why would evolution be so invested in your first act of intercourse? with the high rates of infant mortality, with the, you know, with so many different reasons. And so my theory is that it is, a, you know, it was a, basically a physical protective barrier because before you're, um, you get estrogen in puberty, before you develop pubic hair, before you get fat pads in the labia, the opening to the vagina actually um, is quite vulnerable. And if you get even like a grain of sand in the vagina as a, as a child, you can develop a horrible irritant reaction. So it would make sense to have a physical barrier to protect the vagina. And you know, if you think about us evolutionarily, you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago, we were a lot closer to the ground and we probably sat in dirt and we didn't have clothes. So dirt would have a greater chance of getting in. So doesn't it make sense that we would have a physical barrier? And as we've evolved and we've changed, just like you don't need your wisdom teeth, you don't really need your hymen. <laughs> Do you think that we need to reconsider this idea of virginity? Uh, virginity is a social construct that, um, that is used to weaponize women's bodies against themselves. And um, you know, men don't have to get virginity tests, right? Nobody cares about that. So I think that it's, um, it's, a, it's something that, that you know, might mean something to you personally, um, and, but you should also understand that there's this huge societal pressure and keeping this idea that women should be virginal is, um, if it was applied equally to men and women, that would be different. Uh, doctors often tell patients that cranberry juice can treat or <laughs> prevent urinary tract infections. Is that true? No, there's no studies to support that. In fact, the studies that show it doesn't. And, um, and they're not new studies. Like there was a study in JAMA, which is a large journal, the Journal of the American Medical Association, in 2013 dispelling the myth. Mm -hmm. So, you know, myths are hard to kill. I mean, the hardest one to kill <laughs> is eight glasses of water a day, right? That's totally- You're not supposed to do that? Oh, yeah. I read the book. <laughs> It's totally been disproven. Yeah. And you know what? I get hate mail for writing about that. I'm like, who, what, like big non-water? Like who, who's like funding me? Can it like, hurt to drink eight glasses of water? Uh, well, it's gonna make you pee a lot more, right? And uh, eight glasses, no, you're not gonna get water intoxication, but you're gonna pee a lot more and it's not helpful to you. And wouldn't you rather know the facts? Uh, are sexually transmitted diseases on the rise? Yeah, well, some are. So we're actually seeing a drop in the human papillomavirus because of the vaccination. So there's some great things to sort of celebrate. Uh, but uh, gonorrhea and syphilis especially are on the rise, which is very concerning, especially because a lot of gonorrhea is multi-drug resistant and very hard to treat. Mm -hmm. The other thing is rates of HIV transmission are stable. And it should be zero because we have this amazing tool called pre-exposure prophylaxis, where if you're at high risk for getting HIV, you take a pill every single day and the risk of transmission is essentially zero. Mm -hmm. 
And in the states, we have about 30,000 cases still every year of HIV transmission by sexual activity, and that could be zero. But people can't talk about PrEP because you're considered dirty if you need it, um, which is wrong. I mean, you need what you need. You need the health care you need. And why should it be any more shameful to catch a disease from sexual activity than from shaking someone's hand. You recently got the HPV uh, vaccine, I did. right? Um, who should get the Who should get the vaccine? Well, the the guidelines have been expanded up to the age of 45, and I'm 53. Um, but I decided that I'd never had HPV before, mm -hmm. so the chances are I wouldn't have been exposed to all nine strains in the vaccine, so I would get some protection. And I'm newly dating, and I wanted to do everything that I could to protect myself. Because if you think of I'm dating sort of quasi-age-appropriate men, um, you know, they've, they're, they've all had more than one or two sexual partners. So, uh, you know, the chance that they've been exposed to HPV is really high. So I want to protect myself. And uh, I also wanted to show people that it's not any big deal. And that you can still get it if you're over 45. Yeah, I mean, you might have to pay for it. Mm -hmm. The whole thing about the age and the vaccine it's related to cost effectiveness for governments, right? So it's, you know, you want to target the people who are you're more likely to help, right? So the vaccine's less likely to be helpful the older you get because you're more likely to have been exposed. But it doesn't mean it's useless. Uh, should women um, get yearly pap smears? No, so yearly pap smears are a thing of the past. Cervical cancer screening guidelines do vary a little bit country to country, but in general, they don't need to start till you're 21. And um, the, the, the most often you need to have it is every three years. Um, you've talked a lot about how uh, medicine has ignored women, um, women from uh, uh, marginalized communities. Um, and maybe that's why women are looking to other sources for information to fill the gap. Uh, but how can we all be better patients? Yeah, I think that is so true. I think that um, learning about your body can help make you empowered and a better patient. I think that um, asking questions from everybody, right? Not just your doctor, but um, but from uh, you know if you're going to an alternative medicine provider or wellness, like ask them the same, hold them to the same standard at least. Um, and I think that trust your body, which I think that actually has been weaponized in some ways against women. So there's, for example, an Instagram influencer who tells women that they should trust their bodies and they'll know when they're getting cervical cancer. Right. <laughs> she has 100,000 followers on Instagram. The influence. Right. So that's not what I mean when trust your body. I mean, if you have a symptom and no one's been able to explain it to you, you deserve an explanation. And so if someone hasn't explained to you why that's happening, then you need to find someone else who can. And I, I hate putting the onus on patients because that's not what I mean. But if your provider is not able to explain things to you to your satisfaction, then maybe you need a different provider. And that's it for tonight's agenda in the summer. Tomorrow, we recall why health and science policy expert Timothy Caulfield says celebrities can be bad for your health. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Thanks for watching TVO and for joining us online at TVO.org. And we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. The Agenda is always on. To catch up on conversations from this week or any week, visit our website, TVO.org slash The Agenda or our YouTube page at youtube.com slash the agenda. It's all there for whenever you want to watch. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.